I'm going to be preaching a message. It's not a Mother's Day message, but I can't help but preach this message because I believe that we're in a season where this message is needed. And on top of that, uh, God gave this message to me for today. It was Monday night. I was reading uh, the Bible on my phone. As you know, Faith and Marisa were out of the country, and me and Ethan were uh, laying down. He had fallen asleep, and I grabbed my phone, and I began reading the Bible. And just... It was like the word is just lifted up off the page in front of me. And I know that that's happened to many of you here as well. And I knew I had to study this thing out and I had to deliver it this morning. So this morning we're going to go to work in the, bio, in, the, in the Bible and we are going to break some things down. We're going to go deep today. So what I need everybody to do is to really give me your full attention. Because if you don't give me your full attention, you might take something out of context and then you'll go home and you'll try to remember what was said and you will only remember the clip that you heard and not the full thing in context. And God is speaking through this message here today to encourage us, not only to encourage us, but to set in motion revival in Sealy, Texas. I believe that revival is coming to Sealy, Texas. So we have to start off today by saying that revival is coming to Sealy, Texas. I want you all to say it as well. Do you believe it? Do you believe that revival is coming? So say it. Say it. The reason why I'm having you say it is not to just be cliche and have you repeat after me. It's because it cannot be a thought trapped in our minds. It has to come out of our thoughts and into the atmosphere, and the only way that can happen is through our vocal cords. So we open up our mouth and we declare that revival is coming to Sealy, Texas. So before we go any further, let's just say it one more time. Say, revival is coming to Sealy, Texas. Let's pray and then let's dive into this. Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for this opportunity, God, to come together to break down your word. God, I know you have something special in store for us here this morning that is going to catapult revival in Sealy, Texas. God, we thank you for each and every mother who is in the house here, for every mother who is watching online. We thank you for their dedication to their kids. We thank you for their dedication in the midnight hours to pray. And God, we just thank you for their dedication to the house of God as well. Thank you for their prayer life. Thank you for all that you have instilled inside of them. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, we're going to start off in Jonah. You remember the book of Jonah, and the reason why we will start off here is because it gives us insight to the other text that we will visit here in today's message. It is in Jonah chapter 1 where God tells Jonah to go to Nineveh. How many people remember the call of God upon Jonah's life to go to Nineveh? But Jonah was a lot like a lot of us. He decided he was going to go somewhere else, and he said, you know, God, I hear you calling me to go to this place but I got better plans, and I've got a better idea, so I'll just go to Tarshish. The people there need you as well. But that was not his specific instructions. So Jonah boarded a boat, and he began to go to Tarshish, not to Nineveh where he was called to go, but in the exact opposite direction of where God had called him to do. So God sent out a great wind up on the water that damaged the boat that Jonah was in along with the others who were there in the boat with him. And the others began panicking, and I would too. You know, we would be in a ship, and all of a sudden it's starting to become damaged. The winds are great, the waves are great, and we are out here in the middle of this body of water not knowing what is going to happen. So they began to cry out, and they're like, what do we have to do to stop these waves from damaging our boat? And Jonah realizes that he's the problem because he did not listen to the voice of God. So he rises up, and he says, cast me out of the boat, and the winds will stop. He says that here in Jonah chapter 1, verse 12. He said unto them, take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that my sake, this great tempest, is upon you. You see, God was trying to do something here, but he was not trying to take Jonah's life. 
He was trying to get him back on track so that revival could be sparked in the city of Nineveh. We know this because a couple of verses down in verse 17 of Jonah chapter 1, it says, For thou hast cast me into the deep, into the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about, and thy billows and thy waves passed me over. Now when we get to chapter 2 of Jonah, Jonah begins to pray out while he is in the fish's belly. So the fish comes along and he swallows Jonah up and in there he begins to pray. Jonah chapter 2 verse 3, now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now, in the belly of the fish, if you'll research this, you'll find all types of responses from commentaries and from different scholars. Some scholars will tell you that Jonah died and in the fish came back alive and began to pray. I don't necessarily subscribe to that. I subscribe to the fact that he was being called by God to go to Nineveh. He decided to go the other way. So God came with a great wind and destroyed the boat. And the people threw Jonah off of the boat so that the storm could be calmed. And the great fish was there to save Jonah's life. And inside of the belly of the fish, Jonah had an experience with God. I used to go into prisons often, and I would talk to prisoners, and they would come up for prayer, and every time I would go into a prison, I would think about the belly of the fish. Sometimes, whenever you go against what God has ordained in your life, you end up in a place where God can talk to you one-on-one, -on -one, and he spends time with you there. We remember last week, that we, we broke down Psalm chapter 23 where we said that David said, For yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. This was a place where death should have resided, but Jonah was alive. The reason why we are starting off here in Jonah this morning is to set the, the baseline, to set the foundation of everything else that will come from this point on in this morning's message. The reason why the, what we have to establish is what the meaning of a deep ocean or a deep sea is. If you will read through the Bible and you will research the Bible and you'll study the Bible, you'll see that whenever, we t whenever the Bible talks about a deep ocean or a deep sea, it is talking about a place of death, a place of death. Think about baptism for a second. Let's not overthink this thing. Let's make it simple. So baptism, going down in the water resembles you dying to your flesh, a place where you are being submerged, and then you come out raised to new life. Whenever you think about a large body of water, the body of water in the Bible is talking about a place called death. This can further be shown whenever you study the Bible in Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. There he says, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. What does this word sea mean? There was no more death. We can find this a couple of verses later in verse 4 of Revelation chapter 21. He says, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death. Why? Because the sea, there is no more sea, there is no more death, there is no more sorrow, crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are all passed away. So here is where we are going this morning. I want to take you, we are at the end of the Bible in Revelation, but I want to take you all the way back to the creation. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. And then look at verse 2. It says, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. We have just established that a deep set of water or a deep place of water in the Bible means a place of death. 
the new heaven and the new earth will not have a sea, no more death. But here in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, the Bible says that the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Of the waters. Now, if you have read Genesis chapter 1 and you've read creation and you know what happened in the six days when God began to speak things into existence, you will understand that that starts in verse 3 when he says, let there be light. But before he uttered those words, let there be light, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Isn't it incredible that the first action of all creation was not let there be light. It was the Spirit of God moving upon the waters. The Spirit of God moving upon the place where death should reside. Before God spoke light into existence, his spirit moved upon the face of the waters. The revelation of Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 is that the spirit of God moved before anything else happened. We can try to work things up. We can try and pay things to buy stuff. But I want you to know if the spirit of God is not moving before we step foot into the place, then we are doing it all in vain. We need to step into the presence of God and where his spirit is moving. God did not even say let there be light until the spirit of God had came and moved upon the place. So so the Spirit of God has to begin moving before light can even come into Sealy, Texas. The Spirit of God is going to work, and that is something that God does whenever he calls us to an area. And not only did it move, but where it moved is so very important. Don't just get caught up in the spirit of God moving, but listen and, and read where the spirit of God was moved. It moved upon the face of the waters. So if the deep oceans and the deep seas represent death in the Bible and the spirit of God represents life in the Bible, then what God is showing us is that at the very beginning of creation, his intention was to bring life. His intention was to set you free. His intention was to show you that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Before he even said, let there be light, there was the spirit of God that was moving upon the waters. His very intention from creation. See, God is different than us. God knows everything. He knows exactly what we are going to do. He knew from the very beginning of time that a Savior would need to be sent to earth to seek and to save that which was lost. So when Adam and Eve messed up and it caused us all to be born into sin, from the very beginning, before light was even introduced into the world, the Spirit of God was moving because he knew that life would need to come to a place called death and resurrect us out of this life of flesh and this life that ends up in nothing but death with the Spirit of God residing on the inside of us. So you have to understand that even before light came into the earth, the Spirit of God was moving. We always want to start off with light illuminating a dark room. But before that happens, the Spirit of God has to be at work. John chapter 6, verse 44. God, show me this. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. You see, Whenever we come to Christ, it's because he has drawn us. Before the light can come on in our lives, the Spirit must draw us. Whenever we understand John chapter 6, verse 44, we will realize that salvation is not something that we can earn. Salvation is not something that we can purchase. Salvation is an ultimate response to the Spirit of God drawing on us. So whenever we feel like God is speaking to us and we understand that we are a sinner and we need Jesus Christ and we get to the place where we realize that we are living in darkness and we need God's light to shine upon us, it is his Spirit that goes to work before any of that happens. This is why in, 
in your life, you, you feel this urge to be close to God. You feel this urge to be connected to God. You feel this urge to accept Jesus Christ. It's because the Spirit is drawing you to come into the light. Before light can enter into your life, the Spirit must draw you into the life. Realizing that the Spirit of God drew us to Jesus takes away the self-proclaimed announcement or statement that I found Christ. I'm here to tell you I didn't find Christ. Christ found me. I didn't go searching for him and find him on some journey. No, I was broken and I was in sin and his Holy Spirit came and started to move upon the face of my life and I began to know that I needed Jesus Christ in my life and because his Holy Spirit was drawing me, I responded to it and I said yes to Jesus. There is nothing in my fleshly body that is good enough to even recognize how awesome God God is. You see, this, this flesh that we are living in does not even have a moral compass to point to God without the Holy Spirit pointing us to his direction. So whenever we combine John chapter 6, verse 44, with this next verse, which is Romans chapter 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We'll realize that the Spirit of God moves in our life to bring us from a place of death to a place of life. You see, your flesh is going to ultimately die. It was created from dust and it will return to dust. It is nothing but a holding ground for what's on the inside of you. Your flesh will cause you to sin every single time. But when it's connected and quickened by the Spirit of God on the inside of you, something changes. And all of a sudden, you're not doing the things you used to do because now all of a sudden the light is on the inside of you because the Spirit of God is moving this morning, I'm so glad that he drew me. I'm so glad that he didn't just leave me and try and make me find him. I'm, I'm so glad that he wasn't over on the, the street a couple of blocks over and said, hey, put it in me GPS and try and get over here and try and find yourself to me. No, he came way down to where I was. He didn't say, get up out the mud and then I'll receive you. He said, I'll come down into the mud and dig you out of it because I love you. I care for you. I'm here for you. Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. And the only way that our flesh can respond to him as if the spirit draws us you see whenever we think about finding christ it makes us seem like we're the smart one you know i was a sinner until i found christ no I couldn't find him i was sinning i was too much looking at myself i was too much staring at my flesh but whenever he came knocking on the door and his Holy Spirit was moving on me, I responded to him and I made a decision to give my life to him because of his drawing upon my life. So, so watch this. this. This is how awesome God is. I want, I want you to think about your body. Your body is made up of 70% water. Your body is made up of 70% water. So it can be said that you are deep in the water. If only 30% of you is not water, that means 70% of you is water. That means in the context of today's message, it would make sense for us to say that your body is a great place for the Holy Spirit to go to work. Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, before creation even began, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Your body is 70% water. Isn't it a great place for the Spirit of God to go to work, to go to work into your life that you might be able to proclaim that he is the light, that he is the truth? If the waters in the Bible, the deep waters represent death, and your body is pretty deep in the water at 70%, and your flesh also represents death. I want to tell you that your flesh is dark and corrupt, but it can have the light of God on the inside of it that comes to give you eternal life when the Spirit of God moves upon you. So here it is. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. And this morning, 
He is moving upon the face of the waters in your life. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Know ye not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. The Spirit of God dwells on the inside of us. This body of water, this flesh, is a great place for the Spirit of God to move. So this morning, our cry is move, Holy Spirit. Move in our lives. Move every single action that we take. Every word that is uttered out of our mouth, let your Holy Spirit reside upon it. You see, it's not even about the words that we speak. It's about what's on the words that we speak. Because I can tell you Jesus saves, and I can write it in a card, but if the Holy Spirit is not attached to it, it's just words. I want you to know that when the Holy Spirit pro comes, uh, proceeds out of our mouth with the, with the Bible attached to it, then sin must crumble, devils must flee, and all things that are death must come to life. This is how we get an atmosphere of healing. This is how we get an atmosphere of repentance. This is how we get an atmosphere where salvations are taking place because we're not in it for ourselves and we're not in it just to say something. We're in it to see the Holy Spirit Spirit go to work in our lives. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. It says, Do we begin to commend ourselves, or need we, as some others, epistles of com commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? You are our epistle written in our hearts. Know and read, read of all men. For as much as ye manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables or of stone, but in fleshly tablets of the heart. This morning, the spirit of God can go to work on the inside of us. And when the Spirit of God goes to work on the inside of us, the light comes on. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Verse 2, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Verse 3, and God said, let there be light. The light comes on when the Spirit of God is present and we become a vessel to be used by God. What we get from the Spirit of God is engraved on the inside of us and everywhere that we go, people will read the story that is written on the inside of us, not by ink, but by the Holy Spirit of God. That story tells about how he drew us out from our sin and gave us a steadfast place to stand. That, that story tells about a sinner who was saved by his awesome grace and now is living for Jesus Christ. That story tells of somebody who was broken and now is healed. That story tells about somebody who was in a deathful, in a, a situation where they were in extreme debt and Christ came and gave them the, uh, the understanding on how to get out of it and provided a way when there seemed to be no way. That story, like my, my wife shared here on Mother's Day, they told us to abort both of our kids but today you can see our kids walking here in this church and I want you to know it's because the spirit of God moved upon our hearts and said don't listen to the doctors but trust me don't listen to them saying abort but trust me and as you trust me watch me do a miracle in your life today the spirit of God wants to move upon you you are a body filled up with water and everywhere in the Bible the Bible talks about the spirit of God moving upon the face of the waters this, this morning he wants to move upon your life he wants to move upon your life and he's going to move upon your life if you will allow him and if you will trust him and if you will obey what he says he will provide a way when there seems to be no way so everywhere we go there is some story on the inside of us that was not written by ink not engraved by man but by the holy spirit of god residing on the inside of us
And that's the story I want everybody to know. I want everybody to know the story about how Christ saved me. I want everybody to know the story about the Holy Spirit sealed me and how he delivered me and how he encourages me and how he convicts me and how he sets my feet on solid ground. It's all about him. You see, because if you, if you try and tell the story without God attached, it's nothing but death. It's nothing but defeat. But whenever you attach God and you say, look at what God has done, miracles can happen. Miracles can happen. I'm a walking miracle. Our lives are miracles. Our family being together is a miracle. Our kids are miracles. And I know that each and every one of you has something in your life that you can say if it had not been for God. And as you walk outside of these doors, let that story be told by the Holy Spirit beaming off of the inside of you into every area that you walk through. So therefore, because the Spirit of God likes to move upon the face of the waters, and we are water, then I want you to know that revival is coming to Sealy, Texas. Revival is coming to Sealy, Texas. And no devil in hell can stop the revival from coming. No devil in hell can stop the revival from coming. I'm going to share this. We and, me and John were talking last night through text messages about this morning and, and everything that we were going to be talking about and doing, just, just having a conversation. And I said, remember, he's talked about guitar playing. Hope you don't mind me sharing this. He said, I've tried many times, but I never stuck with it. And I said, remember last week's message, whenever I said, whenever you plant the seed, that's the hardest time because the squirrel wants to come dig it out and ruin it. And he sent me back a GIF. You know what a GIF is? A GIF is a little video, like a five-second video video or a three second video that describes what you want to say but you just can't say it and he sent me a gift of a squirrel going into a planter that was on like a, a launching board and the squirrel went to go get the seed and the thing launched the squirrel across the fence across the yard but that sounds that's funny but whenever I saw it I was like that is perfect because in the beginning stages of anything, and even in the beginning stages of revival, the devil wants to come, take it away, and run off with it and say, I know you thought you were going to do something. I know you were trusting God. I know that you were putting all of your effort into it. I know that you were listening and obeying, but I got their plans for it. And I'm going to take it and move it someplace else. But no, not today, Satan, not today. Not today in Sealy, Texas, not in our lives, not in our commitment to you. Revival is coming to Sealy, Texas. And what does revival mean? What does revival mean? And this is where I'm going to close. What does revival mean here in Sealy, Texas? Revival means three things in Sealy, Texas. The first is that the lost will come to know Jesus Christ as their savior. And I'm not talking about just strangers that will come because they are seeing or hearing what is happening. I'm talking about family members. I'm talking about the spirit of God moving upon those we've been praying for for a very long time. Coming to know Jesus Christ as their savior. The second thing is a commitment to God like never before. A commitment to God like never before. I remember growing up in churches, we would have prayer rooms and people would be praying all service because they wanted a move of God. They wanted their lost teenager to accept Jesus Christ. They wanted them to come to know who Jesus was because they didn't want him to die and go to a place called hell. So dedication like never before. And then the third thing, is what the Bible talks about, signs and wonders following them. When we step out and begin doing what God has instructed us to do and his spirit is moving in the midst of us, signs and wonders shall follow them. So what is a sign and a wonder? A sign and a wonder is a miracle in your life. A miracle is defined by something you cannot obtain in your own strength. You can't buy it and you can't create it. It's ultimately given to you by God. It's like we talked a little bit about last week, the woman with the issue of blood. She came in. She, I mean, she, she gave all of her money. She went to all the doctors. But when she saw Jesus was coming through the city, she said, I've got to get to Jesus. And instantly she was made whole. 
That is a miracle. So God does these three things whenever revival sparks. And I want you to know that that's what he, he wants to do here in Sealy, Texas. So everybody stand with me. I want us to spend a few moments in prayer. I want us to spend a few moments just seeking God for what he is going to do here in our midst. Whenever I was reading Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 on Monday night, the words just popped off the paper that said the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And then he said, let there be light. Light will come to Sealy, Texas when the Spirit of God moves first. So Holy Spirit, we ask that you would move, have your way. We open up ourselves and we say, move in a special way. Do what only you can do. We thank you that we are in this time and in this place to be used by you. We thank you that you have called us out from among them and set us apart and called us to do something great in Sealy, Texas. And God, for every person who is here this morning, I want them to know that as they walk out of these doors that everybody's watching them. Everybody's watching where they go. Everybody's watching what they say. Everybody's watching what they do. And God, I pray that those who are watching will see the Holy Spirit story on the inside of them. A story not written by ink, but a story written by you. I want them to see you in me. I want them to see you in me. I want them to see the Holy Spirit residing in this temple. Revival is coming to Sealy, Texas. The Spirit of God is going to work. And God is saying right now as we're praying, I hear him so urgently saying, don't rush it. Don't rush it. Habakkuk chapter 2. When you get the vision, write it down upon tables. Make it plain. Though it may tarry, it will surely come to pass. If you don't see it happening, that doesn't mean it's not going to happen. In your very life right now, you may not see healing, but I prophesy that healing is coming. You may not see your children serving God, but hold on, hold on and hold on because it'll come to pass. So many prophetic words that were spoken over my life are just now coming to pass. I was talking to somebody this week who over two years ago spoke the word royalty to me, said that God was going to use you in a special way. And yeah, I was serving God and I was doing things for God, but there's something different about this. This is a launching pad for revival. And I know that that word is coming to pass. So when you get a word from God, don't lose it, protect it. Hold on to it. There is revival coming. The Spirit of God is doing some things right now. Not only the people in this church building right now, but the people who are outside of these walls. There is something stirring. I can see it right now as clear as day. There is something stirring. There is the Holy Spirit going to work. And that's exactly what we want, church the Holy Spirit to go out and soften the hearts of the people that whenever we launch out in revival that they would be able to receive it we don't want it to just fall on on hearts of stone we want the Holy Spirit to draw that they might be able to receive what God is going to do in their lives God, we love you. We thank you. Thank you, God. We stand upon your word. We stand upon your call. We stand 
upon the instructions that you gave. We stand. We give all that we have, God. But we know that even all that we can do is not enough if your spirit's not in it. So, Holy Spirit, move. Move upon the face of the waters.